Hi everyone, and I want to welcome everyone at the Freightways audience to this fireside chat. Um, I'm Richard Greening. I'm the Global Technical Director for DDC FPO. I'm also the co-chair of the Bill Lading Working Group at Bitter. Walter. Hey, uh, hello Richard. I'm Walter Vandermeer, and I'm the Customs Director for Regulatory and Compliance uh, with Customs in UPS Europe. I represent uh, UPS in uh, trade associations like Business Europe, like uh, the European Express Association and AmCham EU. Fantastic. So we've been asked to talk today broadly about um, Brexit, which I'm sure we could talk about all day. Um, I guess one of the reasons people have asked us to do this is obviously we've worked together now for, for, for over three years on a, on a Brexit project. And whenever we do get the chance to talk, uh, people always say that they should film it. So we'll we'll see if we can live up to that expectation uh, today or not. But I guess for the fact realising that Freightways audience is a global audience, obviously here in the UK, uh, Brexit's something I hear about multiple times a day, um, maybe in the US or in other parts of the world, but maybe less so. So just, I guess, to give everyone some broad strokes, um, the, the United Kingdom uh, had a referendum back in, uh, in June 2016 to see if they still wanted to be part of the European Union. Um, and the, the vote was to leave 52 to 48. And I think any time when there's a, a divide down the middle there, uh, when it's so close, there's always going to be some people that are unhappy. And that was the starting place. Uh, fast forward three years, two prime ministers later. Um, and then on, I think it was January 23rd, um, the, the UK finally passed the, the EU withdrawal bill uh, and made it law for, for the UK to leave the, uh, the EU. And that came into effect on the, the 31st of, of January 2020. But it took until the 24th of December 2020 for us actually to draw up a, an agreement. And that was seven days before everything had to, to come into effect. So I guess the starting point for you, Walter, is, is really, um, you know, what did that mean for you and, and, and UPS in particular? Thank you, Richard. Well, it's very important to, to understand the background. I mean, the UK uh, left the EU. Uh, it left, uh, in a way of speaking, the club. Uh, so that that uh, implies that the, the previous rules don't apply anymore. If you leave the club, uh, you don't need to, to apply to the rules anymore, but you, still you're doing business uh, with the club, so you have to come up with new new rules and uh, in order to prepare ourselves for that UPS uh, from the first day after the referendum started up different teams that looked at different aspects of, of the changed logistics uh, and that included looking at new hubs, uh, uh, changing the network, uh, preparing IT systems, uh, uh, increasing bank guarantees, uh, getting uh, new customs authorizations. Uh, um, so that, that's been a, a very important uh, work uh, stream and also uh, very importantly uh, at UPS the most important uh, item is having the right skilled people that are trained to cope with that uh, incredible, uh, incredible increase in workload. Mm -hmm. So that, that in a nutshell, uh, what we did to prepare. So I think we saw it across uh, the board. So obviously, uh, you're, you're one of many partners that, that we work with that are working on um, similar projects. But um, I mean, I, I think we joke with, with you, we're on version three. And I think that's because there's all of the twists and turns in the journey. I mean, what, what's it like when you're when something's so out of your control and you don't really you can anticipate everything or try to anticipate everything, but you don't know exactly where it's going to go. And I, and I know we've been on that journey with you. So what's I mean, give us, I guess, some of the broad strokes over the last three years of those those challenges. Well, I, I, I think one of the most challenging items was the unpredictability on, on deployment dates and also on what the requirements would be. I mean, uh, everybody, every economic operator needs to have predictability uh, in order to do business. And, and that certainly was not there. 
And uh, uh, as you said, uh, we, we had this nice Christmas present uh, on the 24th of December mm. with the new free trade agreement called the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Uh, but normally, uh, and uh, I refer to other trade agreements like CETA or the EU-Japan Trade Agreement, you get a long time to prepare to, 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 to change your, your setup. It's between 6, 12, even longer uh, months to, 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 to cope with it. And that was not the case uh, into this situation. But basically, and more fundamentally, uh, we need to realize uh, what, what, what that entails because um, you have a free trade agreement and some people might think, okay, uh, then everything is settled. No, not at all, because you still have customs requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, you start with export documents. Uh, you, we, we have a, an NCTS document, which is a transit bonded uh, uh, document to move the goods. Uh, then we do import declarations. Uh, we need to submit safety and security declarations. So with that, a lot of uh, a lot of new requirements came. A lot of data I involved, and uh, uh, we need to understand that our customers, uh, the the uh, uh, small, medium, and, and big companies, were not used to this anymore. Uh, we are talking. Uh, uh, we're going back to 1992 when there were for the last time customs requirements between the UK and the EU. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, the, the, the Euro tunnel was, was, was just there. Uh, uh, now there, there's 9,000 trucks each day that pass that tunnel that need to go to, to customs requirements. Uh, also, technology has changed uh, uh, completely, uh, but also e-commerce in 1992 uh, was not there, and, and uh, it's now there more than ever, mm. uh, even, and, and that's an, an, another factor with uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, the e-commerce has increased uh, significantly. So that is a bit uh, the background of the challenges uh, that we are facing. Mm. No, I was going to say, I, I started in their career back in 1998, and I think I was told then it was a dying market and I should get out and do something different. And I say little did people know that e-commerce was coming. I know you've been at UPS much longer than, than, than that. So is it, are you coming up for 36 years now with UPS or is that uh, a trade secret yeah, I'm not supposed yeah. to reveal? I, I, I started uh, at UPS uh, uh, in 1994. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I started my career in the port of Antwerp in 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just to give you a, a hint, uh, it is of course the last century, but when I started, the telex was uh, there and we were all delighted about that innovative technology of the facts that made this introduction. So that gives a bit the background. Uh, no, I... And, and in, the, uh, in these 36 years, I have been uh, seeing customs uh, changing uh, dramatically in terms of legislation, in terms of technology, in terms of tasks, because customs uh, traditionally is a revenue collector. Uh, what people need to understand is that customs has grown into a very important uh, actor in terms of safety and security, anti-terrorism, but also in protecting uh, citizens, uh, in checking sanitary, phytosanitary goods, uh, uh, and, and that adds to the complexity, uh, complexity that we now uh, facing with Brexit, because it's not just that we have to pay duties and taxes, no, customs needs to control a lot of more uh, regulations uh, on behalf of other government agencies. I know it's, it's a very good point to say um, when it when it comes to data. So going back to what you were just saying, so 98 for me was you, you know, it was we had there was one server in the office, an NT4 server in the office with a 33 uh, kilobyte mode, modem uh, and people would be checking the email two, three times a day. So the, the, there was no, there was very little data being created. Everything was physical paperwork, physical bundles and people were used to it taking time to be delivered and the billing functions and all of the other functions were things that just happened. Whereas we're now in this instant environment, right? I, I, I often use it as and say the, the Uber world. It's, you know, people use Uber or they did before the pandemic and it just made something that everyone used to do that much easier. And it's making people ask the questions of well, why isn't this this easy and why isn't this this easy? And so we also have, you say, your your customers where you touched on e-commerce, you know, the, the expectation of an e-commerce customer 
um, must be extremely high on what on how they expect their freight to move. Indeed, and and also, uh, and now let's make it a bit more complicated, mm -hmm. because on the first of January, uh, two thousand twenty-one, not only uh, the, the 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 Brexit came into effect, but also the UK decided to come up with a complete new VAT legislation, mm -hmm. uh, where for for goods below 135 GB pounds, and that's a lot of e-commerce, uh, there's no requirement to pay the import VAT anymore, but you have, as a, as a supplier or shipper, you have to charge your customer with, with the VAT. So uh, that, that is a, a, a maybe an improvement because you don't need to go through that import declaration anymore. We still submit an import declaration, but we don't pay the VAT on behalf of the customer anymore. Mm -hmm. He pays an, a, a, a VAT included price to his supplier, but uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertitude and there's a need for, for more knowledge on that because this is a complete new way of doing business. Uh, uh, and that that is one of, of the other items related to e-commerce that make it uh, very complex. And, and to expand it a bit uh, uh, for people that think that Brexit was the last uh, uh, change to the supply chain in Europe, well, it's rather for the, the, the start of changes because uh, going ahead, we will see a, a similar VAT reform in, in the EU on the 1st of July. Mm -hmm. uh, we see uh, a, another way to approach safety and security data with the import control system release too. That kicks in on the 15th of March. So what, what we see is that customs tries, uh, tries to catch up with the realities of today. And, and unfortunately, um, they are always a bit later than, than the reality uh, demands. No, absolutely. So uh, again, again, as I touched on earlier, obviously you're one of a few partners we've worked with on on similar projects, and 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 you've taken it extremely seriously from day one. Heavily invested. There was a lot of contingency planning that went in that changed and had to be very agile um, along the way. Um, what's your? I, I guess because we've seen a spectrum of of clients where you know some of the guys we've we we talked to didn't know or, or, or didn't have access to the information and smaller businesses well haven't got necessarily the resources um, to be able to plan or invest, right? So they sat on the fence assuming these things were, were gonna just, you know, eventually it would become clear or they'll be told exactly what to do. Um, I guess the, one of the things we got panicked with with some of our clients we were talking to last year is that you've, you've got to make decisions otherwise you will be left behind. I mean, what was, what was UPS's approach um, from, I guess, from day one, pretty much? What, what was the, what was your, how did you, how, how was it envisioned? Why did, why did you invest and take it as seriously as you did, I guess, is the question. Well, we, we, because uh, our, our business is moving goods uh, seamlessly uh, uh, and frictionless uh, uh, from point A to point B, mm. uh, and in that uh, uh, customs is a major component, and that that's a bit uh, the story of my professional life. Uh, customs always has been seen as a nuisance, but if you master your subject, uh, you you are able to add value to your customer. So uh, while customs will never be seamless, mm -hmm. if you have an experienced uh, uh, intermediary like UPS in between, mm -hmm. for the uh, for the end customer, it will be kind of a, a transparent uh, experience, and that's uh, uh, why we also have invested so much in. Into, into Brexit preparing for these customs uh, formalities. And, and putting your money where your mouth is, obviously I know, I know some of these answers, but we're, 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 we're over two months over into uh, what we'll call proper Brexit now. Um, what, what, are, uh, what are some of the challenges where we're still facing or UPS is facing um, even now we're, we're two plus months in? Well, uh, basically, uh, they are uh, very diverse. I mean, uh, we, we see that some of the customs IT systems are, are not uh, doing what they are supposed to do uh, without going into detail, uh, because we know 
how challenging it can be with, 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 with IT systems. Uh, we also see that uh, in, in some customs offices, and not, I do not speak for UPS alone. Mm -hmm. I know this from, from, from uh, uh, the Express Association. Some of the customs offices uh, uh, are not, not really staffed up to, to process all this volume mm. uh, because uh, uh, we, we've seen a tremendous amount of additional uh, volume and that needs to be processed uh, 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 by us but also by customs. So that, that's been uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges. Uh, then the, the, the knowledge of, of the, 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 the public, uh, I mean, uh, let's take uh, origin. People uh, or some people think, okay, there's a trade agreement between the EU and the UK, so I do not have to pay import duties mm -hmm. anymore. Well, that is true if you can prove and if you can claim the origin status. But uh, as we have been talking about e-commerce, a lot of these products are being manufactured not in Europe anymore or the UK. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay import duties. And then we come into the next challenge. A customer uh, then then uh, gets a shipment and he gets a bill. Mm -hmm. He gets a bill for import duties that he didn't expect. He, he has to pay uh, VAT. And people uh, uh, are not aware that your VAT is calculated on the merchandise value, mm -hmm. on the freight value, on the import duties that you pay. And there you apply in the UK your 20% to. So that, mm -hmm. that has led to a lot of uh, confusion uh, with, with the public and uh, of course, I do understand that yeah. uh, in a B2C relationship, you reach customers that m maybe even do not know that they bought something online in Europe. There's definitely been some horror stories in the UK that's that's made the mainstream media. Uh, you know, uh, uh, women buying two hundred pound coats and being hit with eighty pounds worth of duty um, on top of it, and and then them just returning the goods because they weren't aware of uh, of what the charges were. So that must create an awful lot of challenges. Um, too, because someone has to pay the costs ultimately. That's the, the you know, when you're when you're moving goods and, and you're shipping. So, um, I guess on the on the data front, I mean, you, you've touched on a couple of things there. So you you talked about um, uh, government systems, for example, and obviously I've had some experience in the past with that, and they can be some of the challenges and some of the the, the bottlenecks in keeping goods moving. Um, but but what are um, what are the, the, the things that we need to focus on next? What are the things that I guess need to change um, as far as I guess, from your perspective, I suppose technology or just, or, or just supply process? Well, I, I, I'm going to come back to the uh, example that we were in uh, with the, the lady with, with her coat that, yeah, that okay. she ordered and, 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 and then refused mm -hmm. uh, because she was not prepared for to, to pay import duties. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the next thing is she wants to return that. Mm -hmm. And if there's one weak angle in current customs legislation, it are returns because then uh, that, that for that uh, uh, coat, you need to have an invoice. You need to export declare it. It needs to go back. You need to uh, apply a return goods procedure. So it it's very complex and uh, it uh, makes the life of UPS difficult, but also the life of customs. It's just additionally, it adds on to already that increased amount of goods. And if you know uh, the reality of e-commerce, there are a lot, there's an in, in impressive component of return goods. Mm -hmm. So that's something that uh, uh, we call on uh, uh, as UPS, but also in our business associations, both the UK and the EU to sit together and to find simpler ways to move these goods because that will uh, make our uh, and that uh, lives easier and also the life of our customers. Now that's something we've definitely seen as well, Walter, as you say, the, the, the clients we work with, you know, the e-commerce type businesses, uh, as you say, they've got a piece where, is, where when we were heading to a no deal uh, Brexit, the concern was is what were the, if, um, what were the charges going to be for missed, well, I suppose you've got one, one misdeclaring of goods the other side is if you don't do that matching process, right, where of the goods going out and then back in or vice versa, then in theory, we thought that you could be, if you don't match them, there'd be double duty charges. Obviously, there's no yeah. duty now, but there's still a piece where we those need to be matched. And that's a piece of work that all these businesses need to do. And then you've also got the mystic 
declaring of goods. So even if there aren't any duty charges on things, you miss declaring goods still leads to fines and penalties, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which brings us to a question I have to you, uh, oh, Richard, uh, okay. uh, and, uh, and and that is about uh, data. Uh, we know the importance of, of, of data. Without data, we, we are lost. But uh, what, what are some of the items that you see that are significant uh, and relevant? Um, I guess the the uh, the the big mis the misunderstanding that people have had uh, last year with some of the conversations I guess I've been involved in is is GDPR. Um, so people make the assumption that GDPR is a is an is an EU regulation. Um, the reality is is the UK changed its data protection law back in two thousand and eighteen to GDPR. So that hasn't changed in any shape or form. So we are we still have to comply and, and it is a good format to comply to. So again, one of the challenges I guess I have when talking to people, it's similar to what you were saying a minute ago um, with customs being a, a something that people kind of grit, grit their teeth of and know it's something they need to do. I guess good, good housekeeping on data um, is equally important and, and similar to what you were saying about what's down the road. So if you, if in broad strokes we talk about GDPR at the moment, really at the moment, you, you, the only requirements put onto you by GDPR is that you understand all your data, you understand all your data processes and you understand where all your data is stored. And, and a couple of years ago, I think that was challenging for quite a few businesses. I think most businesses within the UK anyway have made great inroads into into understanding the need and necessity but it 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 was something they never had in their IT budget or in their business budget it was a new line that had to be added in so it took them a while to to wrap their head around it i guess the concern from my side is um, the gdpr will increase its security in where data is stored particularly you know there's going to be certain types of data that potentially do need to be held in certain regions moving forward for certain reasons or you're going to work with certain clients that are going to have specific requirements that require data to be held in particular places and and i think that's something for smaller businesses they're going to find challenging if they haven't got um, a global network i think so um so I guess to answer your question, really, an understanding, if, if, you, if, you, if, if people don't understand their data now, they, they need to, and they need to be aware that they, the type of restrictions and the, and the requirements that clients are going to want and are going to need to put on them are going to grow, um, similar to what you were saying about um, the changes within EU. Yeah, that, that, that's indeed uh, the case. And uh, what's also important uh, uh, in terms of technology is uh, in, in the EU, uh, the legal framework consists of the Union Customs Code, uh, which was uh, being started developing in 2010. It was adopted in 2013, came into effect in 2016, and it, it should uh, increase the capacity of uh, uh, of customs to do risk assessment, to collect uh, revenues. It should make things easier and uh, it came with a lot of technology because one uh, side of it of that union customs code was the uh, trade facilitation one example is centralized import clearance which means that today you still need to uh, make a customs declaration in each member state of the eu sometimes mm -hmm. with different requirements mm -hmm. and um, uh, we were promised and it was in the union customs code law that by 2020 all it systems would be in place to uh, to provide that functionality mm -hmm. well due to to a lack uh, of subsidies of money due to uh, i mean a, a lack of, of um, estimating the correct complexity of it uh, we are now talking about 2025 before mm. that will be completed mm. so that that's a life cycle of 15 20 years and uh, you know this better than me richard in in technology then you're uh, again you're already outdated if you uh, work with with cycles like that I guess uh, I guess uh, I guess uh, I'll, I will end on this question. So it's really about visibility, and I think it covers a lot of things we've touched on today. But in particular, I know you and I have spoken about this in the past. I like your your view, or uh, uh, give everyone your slant. I guess on on I guess blockchain technology and where you think this potentially applies in the future. 
Yeah, um, blockchain technology, I think, is an opportunity. I don't know if it's the only opportunity, mm -hmm. but uh, it allows customs to access pieces of data without the actors then uh, sharing their data between themselves. So that that uh, gives the customs the, the possibility to do their risk assessments uh, and other assessments much prior into the life cycle of a shipment. And that's, that's where we need to move to. Uh, what is also important is that uh, um, we uh, come together as uh, the institutional stakeholders uh, and all the big uh, e-commerce players, uh, the express carriers, and that we uh, brainstorm about a new way of doing business that is compliant, but that's also uh, fit for today's business realities. Uh, because I gave uh, the, the example of, of returns, uh, there is still the impossibility to, to do a in centralized import clearance. So uh, th th there are a lot of opportunities, but we need to grab these opportunities now, or Europe will not be competitive in a couple of years from now. I think that's a great place for us to leave off for today. I think you've you've made the message loud and clear on, on what we need to do, where we need to go. I, I would vote for you, Walter, for whatever it is you want to run for. Um, so I, I guess for, for me, I want to thank everyone for, um, uh, for attending and hopefully you've learned something. Walter, do you have anything to add? No, it's been a pleasure and uh, looking forward to our next conversation, uh, videotaped or not. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and everyone enjoy the rest of your sessions. Thank you.